From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome back to the show. My name is Dana. They call me Doc Holliday. Alexis codenamed Doc Holliday Jackson to be specific. We are here as always with our super producer, Paul Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this stuff they don't want you to know. You may have noticed, fellow conspiracy realists, that something out of the ordinary is happening here. There is a disturbance in the force. Do not adjust your speakers. Um, ben, Matt, and No's voices did not get higher over the weekend. Uh, what's actually happening here the day that this is being released, Monday, March 8th, is International Women's Day. So iHeartRadio is doing an initiative to sort of observe the day by, um, you know, spotlighting female artists on the radio stations and having female hosts of podcasts take over some of your favorite podcasts, including stuff they don't want you to know. Um, or, you know, the too long didn't read to quote the six time Academy Award nominated film, Captain Phillips. Look at us. We are the captain now. Uh, but we're only the captain for today. You'll be back to your regularly scheduled program tomorrow. So in the meantime, why not sit back? Relax and enjoy this delectable treat of spending some time with us. Yeah, me and Dana are taking over the show. So Dana, do you want to tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, I am so happy to be here. Normally, I am the host of Noble Blood, which is a podcast that tells uh, historical stories about royals from history that, I mean, semi-coincidentally just usually happen to end in, in bloodshed, most of them. <laughs> Uh, but it is an absolute treat not just to be talking to myself in a dark closet and to actually have uh, a co-host that I can that I can chat with to to get to the bottom of this really interesting topic that I've had so much fun digging into. Yeah, yeah, same. So, like, seriously, thank you for joining us. I'm excited that you're here. I'm excited to be here. So, yeah, let's let's start digging into some of this stuff that we've been looking at. So. Depending on where you are listening in the world, you have probably heard of a little group of islands known as Hawaii. Um, if you're listening from the United States, you probably know it as one of the 50 states. If you're listening from somewhere else in the world, you might know it as a really beautiful vacation spot. If you are in the United States military, you may have been stationed there at some point at one of the many military bases. But basically, probably know of it again as one of the states in the United States without necessarily knowing that much about the history of how it became a state. I was actually talking to my dad randomly one day in August and we were talking about how not that many people really know the story because it's one of those things we're just kind of told, you know, like, oh, yeah, Hawaii is one of the 50 states, one of the ones that's easiest to identify on a map. And like we just sort of like accept that, you know, the same way that we're told that Christopher Columbus whoosh, whoosh, discovered America in 1492. And then, you know, what do they tell us? Uh, you know, yeah, there were some people that were already here, but they all got along swimmingly and they sat down and had the first Thanksgiving dinner together and everybody got along great. Yeah, just a just a really great, happy dinner. That's all it was. <laughs> just a really nice, fun dinner. Yeah, seriously. And then, you know, eventually the United States like expanded West. Don't worry about that. And then, you know, some other things happened in history. You know, there was this thing called slavery and that was sort of bad. But then Abraham Lincoln freed the slaves. And then later, like Martin Luther King said some stuff. And then everybody skipped through fields of daffodils and we all lived happily ever after. Right. You don't necessarily hear about some of the like atrocities that happened to indigenous people here, which is what we're going to be talking about today, like sort of how the indigenous people of Hawaii played into this whole history. But yeah, you don't necessarily hear about those stories, like the Trail of Tears or the things that happened to, um, you know, other people of color, like the bombings of black cities. That's just not something that you necessarily learn in grade school history. And I say all the time that I feel like the world would be a better place. And in particular, the United States would be a better place if there was a more comprehensive, thorough version of history taught in schools, because we'd have like more empathy for one another and also an understanding of how these institutions came to be. And so today I just really want to examine how all of this played out in terms of, yes, Hawaii is a state. Hawaii is the 50th, like the last state to be added to the union. But how did the people that were there before Americans got there, 
how did they feel about this? So, And I that is, I think, so well said. And another thing is, if you're anything like me, just like taking AP U.S. history at a generic high school in the middle of America, they just totally gloss over the actual process by which a sovereign territory becomes a state. Mm-hmm. Like the fact that Hawaii was a, a kingdom with a monarchy, a native population, and a full functional government – that usually is like a paragraph in history textbooks, and then it's like, and then it uh, became a state of the union. <laughs> and so I also think it's worth examining the ways in which I think a lot of Americans don't want to reckon with the fact that America is sort of an international empire, and the actual seizing of Hawaiian lands was not necessarily legal, even at the time, even by like the standards that existed at the time, it it skated the, the thinnest lines of the law, which then in, in 1993, which we'll get to, I think it was 93, mm-hmm. which we'll get to again, we the American government apologized, but we didn't give back Hawaii. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, we did not. So let's go ahead and start from the beginning. Here are the facts. So according to uh, archaeologists, it's generally believed that um, Hawaii was first settled in somewhere between 300 CE and 1100 CE by um, like sort of a Polynesian migration that happened. And that's how the islands were initially settled. The first European to reach uh, to reach the Hawaiian Islands was Captain James Cook, who's really famous as like a, a British navigator and captain in the Royal Navy. He's also really famous for his voyages to Australia. And so uh, if you if you know one sort of British Navy figure, it's probably him. He, quote unquote, discovered Hawaii in <laughs> he 1778. Upon Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, he accidentally stumbled upon Hawaii. And he wrote about his findings and he wrote about how beautiful it was and it attracted more European visitors. But European visitors also meant that it exposed the indigenous Hawaiian people to diseases like smallpox, measles, polio. And by 1820, the population of native Hawaiians had been cut down by more than half. Because remember, there was no inherent immunity in the native populations against these European diseases. So the diseases absolutely ravaged the population. And of course, Hawaii was also really rich in natural resources. So for a lot of Europeans who settled there for a few generations, they made a lot of money uh, exploiting some actually uh, migrants from uh, Asian countries on sugar plantations and making a lot of money building sugar plantations there. Yeah. And so like between all of these events, like the the population and the the land, like there were so many changes that Hawaii sort of went through after these first couple of years. As a side note, uh, Captain Cook was killed by Hawaiians after trying to kidnap their king, which I just, you know, think is an important addendum to this whole story. Um, but <laughs> anyways, saying all of that to say that very early on, very quickly, it had this huge impact on the population of Hawaii. And according to the Pew Research Center, one in 17 Native Hawaiians had died within two years, two years of Cook's arrival. And by 1800, the population had declined by 48 percent. And then by 1820, it had declined by 71 percent. It just like dwindled. So it was like an immediate impact. And then even more horrific, I mean, not more horrifically, equally as horrifically, these Native Hawaiians lost their political rights in the land. Something called the Bayonet, what came to be known as the Bayonet Constitution of 1887, happened when a group of, of white landowners, some of them born in Hawaii, uh, some some immigrants, basically what later came out was they held the king at, at Bayonet Point and forced him to sign this constitution that turned the Hawaiian monarchy into basically a powerless figurehead. And even more insidious, that constitution withheld the right to vote for the legislature in Hawaii to only property owners with exorbitant property requirements. And they also explicitly refused the right to vote to the many Asian immigrants who had come to the island of Hawaii to work on these sugar plantations predominantly owned by by white landowners. So now with these new wealth restrictions and land restrictions on voting in Hawaii meant that the majority of people the majority of native Hawaiians were no longer able to even vote. 
Yeah. And like, that's what well, I sort of crazy to think about, like how that all played out. But the thing is, is this is going to be really important as a sort of like domino effect or a snowball that's rolling down the hill that ultimately brings us to like the rest of the things that happen. Because it all this is sort of something that happened gradually over time that started with the bayonet constitution um, and then how that's going to ultimately lead to the overthrow and annexation of Hawaii and all that jazz. And so I think it's important to note here that while all this is going on, a person that's sort of, you know, the puppeteer behind the scenes is pulling a lot of these strings is the U.S. minister to Hawaii, a man by the name of John L. Stevens. Stevens uh, gave a quote in 1892 that I think embodies and sort of perfectly represents uh, the attitude that politicians in America had towards Hawaii. In the words of John L. Stevens, quote, the Hawaiian pear is now fully ripe, and this is the golden hour for the U.S. to pluck it. Here's where it gets crazy. So a little bit of background before we get into the actual coup that overthrew the Hawaiian government. Hawaii was a monarchy, and not just uh, a, a, a domestic monarchy that only existed within the confines of the island itself. It was an internationally recognized monarchy. In fact, the last queen of Hawaii, Queen Lili Uokalani, uh, when she was just a princess, when her brother was the, was the king, she was invited to Queen Victoria's Golden Jubilee in London to celebrate Queen Victoria reigning for 50 years, among all of the other monarchs and princesses of the world. It was actually at Queen Victoria's Jubilee when she got word that she had to return to Hawaii immediately because Hawaii had been uh, subject to the the Bayonet Constitution. Queen Liliuokalani, even before she was an actual uh, monarch in name, always took a real leadership position in Hawaii and frequently acted as a regent when her older brother was away on, on business or travel. During one period in 1881, when she was acting as regent, there was a massive smallpox epidemic in one of the ports of Hawaii. And again, remember that smallpox was incredibly deadly, especially to the native population who had no natural immunity. Queen Liliuokalani made the immediate and incredibly unpopular decision amongst businessmen to close the ports. She contained the the outbreak. Deaths were limited. It was, by all accounts, a humanitarian success. But to the businessmen from that moment on, uh, for that reason, amongst others, she was an enemy. She was someone who fundamentally wanted to protect the lives of natives over the business interests of sugar plantation owners. So it was when Lilio Kalani finally became queen that the actual coup against her happened. This coup was led by a group of powerful uh, white landowning men, uh, some of whom were born in Hawaii, some of whom had immigrated later in life. But they gathered together under something called that they called uh, very ominously the Committee of Safety in order to overthrow the monarchy. But they didn't do it alone. And here's where the United States comes in. Though the United States uh, knew that it was uh, illegal to go into a sovereign nation and invade with their army, the USS Boston, which was a a Navy ship, just a Marine ship, pardon me, uh, just landed right on shore, right in view, called by John L. Stevens to protect United States interests, which, of course, in this case, was protecting the interests of the sugar plantation owners who were doing this revolution. And the interests of John L. Stevens himself. Like, the role that he plays in this is all just, like, very noteworthy. And the president at the time, Grover Cleveland, is going to have a lot to say about his role in this that we are going to talk about some more after we get past the coup itself. Yeah. And one more, just uh, it's, it's boring to get into the nitty gritty, but a lot of this comes down to not just wanting like a nice vacation spot that they didn't need to show their passports to get to. It came down to, to issues of sugar tariffs, basically the Hawaii in, in a nutshell, and I'm, I'm vastly oversimplifying, but the United States had uh, allowed incredibly favorable tariffs with Hawaii for the sugar imports and also the imports of things like pineapples, which 
uh, Stanford Dole, who, if you now know Dole Pineapples, he was a major character and major player in this in this little arrangement. But then uh, a little bit later, what happened was there was a uh, new tax law that then lowered tariffs for all international shipments. So then the United States was flooded with cheaper sugar from all over the world. And those favorable conditions that were limited to just Hawaii previously were eliminated. So now these landowners really had their eye on being annexed by the United States and eventually becoming a state because it would make sugar trading uh, much more lucrative. So it it, it comes down to, to money in a really gross way. And also, of course, the just complete racist disregard for a sovereign people that already exist. So here we are. We are spinning a tale of money and treachery and pineapple and sugar. And we're going to find out why the rest of this history is not so sweet after a word from our sponsors. All right. And we're back. So far, we've talked a little bit about the history of Hawaii, starting from when it was settled and then what happened after their first contact with Westerners and the disease. And now all of this is sort of coming to a head as we get to this actual overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy in 1893. On January 16th, the Queen's Minister of the Kingdom actually got a tip that a coup was coming, and he actually requested arrest warrants for all 13 members of the, remember, quote unquote, Committee of Safety, which was this group of 13 uh, incredibly wealthy, well-connected white landowning men. But the cabinet was nervous about all-out warfare, and they knew that these men uh, were incredibly connected, especially with the United States military, who were very close at hand. And so the cabinet denied the arrest warrants. The very next day, there's a Hawaiian policeman who tries to inspect a crate of weapons that are being gathered by the committee's paramilitary group that they're assembling in, in preparation for this coup. The native Hawaiian policeman is shot he survives, but he is the only physical bloodshed that happens in this bloodless coup because the queen is, uh, from her view in the palace, she can literally see the USS Boston, the Marine ship, approach with nearly 200 Marines on shore. The orders of the USS Boston were to, and this is very nebulous, protect American business interests. And they could have justified that, well, chaos is bad for business. They said, the USS Boston, I'm paraphrasing, that, you know, they would only get, in, that America was just supervising, that they would only get involved if there was fighting, which, <laughs> you know, is like, okay, well, that's great. But now how how is she supposed to defend herself from this paramilitary group that's trying to overthrow her population? Right. They're like, well, we're just chaperoning. Like, you're, yeah. like you're at the middle school dance. We won't get involved unless you're dancing too close. And, you know, exactly. and we're worried about your purity. <laughs> They're chaperoning because, like, we don't, just in case she tried to protect her country. We're chaperoning to make sure that this is a bloodless coup. The coup's happening, but we just want to make sure it's a bloodless coup. Yeah, no, seriously. And so basically what happens in order to stop bloodshed, the queen just sort of says, okay, you know, I, I'll step down, I'll surrender. But then she sends a letter to the president saying, hey, basically... I'm sort of surrendering to the U.S. government and you all are going to fix this and restore Hawaii to its, you know, natural monarchy, right? Yeah, so that um, basically when this whole coup was being organized, the president at the time was Benjamin Harrison, who was very pro-imperialist and very pro-annexing Hawaii. And the the com I'm doing air quotes every time I say it, the Committee of Safety knew that if they overthrew the Hawaiian monarchy while Harrison was president that he would uh, easily, that Benjamin Harrison would, would easily want to annex it as a state. But then, unfortunately, Grover Cleveland gets elected. And Grover Cleveland was incredibly anti-imperialist. If you might recall from uh, your AP U.S. history class, so maybe, uh, Cleveland <laughs> is the only president who served two non-consecutive terms. And just to plant you in this story. This is the second of his non-consecutive terms. So Cleveland realizes that something messed up happened in Hawaii and that the United States was involved. And so 
he appoints a former congressman named James Blount to in, independently investigate what had happened during the overthrow of the Hawaiian monarchy, thinking, okay, something happened here, and and I know the U.S. was involved, and probably in a bad way. Yeah, so this report is released six months, almost to the day after the coup, and it's a 1,342-page report condemning the takeover of Hawaii, and Blout even uses the words as an act of war. Meanwhile, Grover Cleveland, President Grover Cleveland, is saying that he's ashamed of the whole affair, Another quote from him that I think is really worthwhile from his message relating to the Hawaiian Islands from December 1893. He says there is no pretense of any consent on the part of the government of the queen, which at that time was undisputed and was both the de facto and the de jure government. And it appears that Hawaii was taken possession of by the United States forces without the consent or wish of the governor of the islands or of anybody else so far as shown, except the United States minister, the dude that we <laughs> referenced earlier, a uh, Mr. John L. Stevens, who I also want to point out, there's another quote from the U.S. National Archives and Records Administration that says, you know, without permission from the U.S. State Department, Minister Stevens recognized the new government and proclaimed Hawaii a U.S. protectorate. Like this was a lot like he was pulling a lot of the strings here and not necessarily with the the full blessing of the United States government at the time. Oh, absolutely not. And actually in an address to Congress, because President Cleveland is so disappointed by this entire situation, he literally states that the Hawaiian uh, government had, quote, been overthrown. And now I'm starting the quote. Sorry about that. Uh, quote, by an act of war committed with the participation of a diplomatic representative of the United States and without authority of Congress. I mean, he the the Blount uh, report li- basically determines that the U.S. minister, this Johnny L. character, had landed the USS Boston Marine ship under false pretenses to support the coup. That that in effect is an illegal act of war that he did independently without Congress supporting it. Yeah. So like keep all of that in mind. Also keep in mind what we said earlier about how uh, Native Hawaiians have been disenfranchised from voting, you know, a few years prior. There's just like a lot of pieces that are coming into play here about how this all shakes out. So Queen Lilio Kalani at the time, she wrote several letters like over the course of a few years. But in this one in particular, what I want to point out is that she says, you know, I call upon the president and the national legislature and the people of the United States to do justice in this matter and to restore to me this property, the enjoyment of which is being withheld by your government. And she also refers to it as a misapprehension of her right and title. So, again, like this was not she didn't just say, OK, you guys, it's fine. You know, you all can take. Hawaii like that never really happened like she was still protesting this even years later and also I think it's worth noting that Native Hawaiians were also protesting at the time you know there were petitions that were signed by like tens of thousands of Native Hawaiians saying that they did not support this that they did not want any of this to be happening and so the thing is as we talk about the history of how Hawaii became a state and how Native Hawaiians like fell into this as it was happening. It's just, you know, this is like all important to note that like one, by a lot of different people in the United States government at the time, you know, President Grover Cleveland, um, other members of Congress who were like, yo, this isn't cool or this isn't legal. Like there were a lot of different sort of like pieces that were connecting here at the same time. Yeah. And and Queen Lily Okalani never, I mean, she didn't give up this fight to to get the United States to not only recognize what they had done wrong, but actively work in helping to to reverse it. She actually, Queen Lily Uokalani actually comes to the United States and meets with a representative of President Cleveland who says, yes, the United States could be willing to help her return to the throne, but only under the condition that she give a full pardon to the group of conspirators who tried to depose her. And I think justifiably, Leo Kalani is like, are you kidding? A full pardon to people who <laughs> literally tried to, who just overthrew my government? Like, I'm going to consult my counsel, punish the traitors, at least, like, banish them. Like, something. You can't just, like, illegally overthrow a monarchy and not get in trouble. Yeah. And for what it's worth, you know, she even pointed out, like, from the Hawaiian Constitution, I think she referenced actually the Bayonet Constitution yeah. and, like, what it said therein about how treason or, like, how something like this was supposed to be approached. So it wasn't like she was just, like, off with their heads. You know, she was following the the Constitution of Hawaii. And, you know, it's, it's funny enough that you say off with her heads because... 
If you can imagine, the 19th century was uh, incredibly racist and othering in terms of a, a woman who wore sometimes native Hawaiian dress and came to Washington. Like she was celebrated more as a um, like anomaly and like I'm I'm using this word again with air quotes so that like her exoticness was something that people were. Uh, thought were appealing, like appealing or interesting. But then by the time that, you know, she was demanding the United States help her revert her kingdom to its rightful authority, propaganda papers were uh, painting her as a, like, dark-skinned barbarian queen who was literally calling for those American businessmen to be beheaded in the streets. And Lilio Kalani wrote about, in her memoir, talking about, hearing that charge against her being repeated so much. And though she, quote, immediately sent my protest that I had not used those words attributed to me. So just the the incredibly, like, racist and othering media at the time who saw her as, like, this strange and wild woman was like, oh, because she wants to punish these traitors, she's going to be beheading rich Americans. And she's like, no, I'm not. I just, I I want them... (laughs) to face legal retribution through the law. Yeah, and there's like all this hearsay and like how she's represented it, like, excuse me, how she's represented in the media. And of course, you know, in this day and age, she doesn't have her own Twitter account where she can go on and reach the masses and say, hey guys, I didn't say that. So like this, of course, impacts the way that general, you know, sort of like the American populace views the situation. And over time, we'll sort of see how the shift in the like popular opinion and also in particular the opinions or the different positions that people have in Congress, how that all affects how things play out. But, you know, even so, Queen Lily Okalani wants the monarchy restored and so eventually then does agree to those full pardons. But by then, the provisional government in Hawaii had consolidated its hold Uh, And Cleveland sort of had less clout when it came to the issue of Hawaii. And so since Congress uh, was controlled at the time, this feels like such a modern story, like age as old as time of like a president (laughs) who like wants to get something done, but doesn't really have enough power to go against Congress. Congress was controlled by Cleveland's like Republican enemies. And so they commissioned their own investigation, which was chaired by a um, former Confederate general. John oh yeah, Tyler he was Morgan. also a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. Oh yeah, so nothing, nothing bad there. Uh, they had their own investigation, which surprise, surprise, reported <laughs> that actually America hadn't done anything wrong in the coup, and so the matter is solved. That's it. And uh, <laughs> Cleveland's Grover Cleveland's hands were tied. Uh, yeah. So that was as far as Queen Lilio Kalani could go with America, trying to hold America accountable for w- how they had participated. Yeah. And the thing to note is that, you know, there are like opposing positions about this in terms of like how people feel about it or how people view it. Um, another senator that I want to point out in 1898, because this is when we're sort of getting to the actual annexation. You know, we've already had the overthrow and they proclaimed it the Republic of Hawaii. And this is when we're going to start to get into when it becomes like a U.S. territory. And but I want to point out this quote because I think it's really interesting. This is happening um, as they're getting ready to annex it as a congressional joint resolution, because the thing is, it's like the Republic the Republic of Hawaii had already like drafted a treaty, basically, and they were trying to pass this through Congress, but it didn't have enough votes to be passed, particularly because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, you had Native Hawaiians that were signing petitions saying that they didn't want this. They didn't want to be annexed. And, you know, at the time, this uh, particular petition was signed by more than 21,000 Native Hawaiians, which was most of the population of Native Hawaiian adults at the time. This is in 1897. Those petitions can be found in the records of the U.S. Senate and in the National uh, Archives and Records. So you can actually like see the petitions with the signatures if you're interested. So, yeah, as Alexis was saying with these petitions, Native Hawaiians are absolutely protesting this provisional government turned at annexation, turned occupational statehood. Queen Lilio Kalani, her own home is ransacked, and she's brought in front of a military court, and she has hundreds of supporters that are arrested and protesting. Six of her supporters were scheduled to be hanged, and in order to spare their lives, the, the thing that I think dr- has driven Queen Lilio Kalani, at least in my reading, her entire life, is trying to protect the lives of her people and 
her final act of sacrifice is in order to spare the lives of these six protesters, Queen Lily Okalani formally renounces her throne. Yeah. And so, you know, like I was saying, of course, the, the initial treaty did not make it through Congress. But what happens around this time is that the Spanish-American War starts and it's like, oh, now Hawaii is like a useful location in terms of refueling. It's like a strategic location to have. So now um, the people that are pro-annexation sort of present this to Congress as a joint resolution to annex. And then that requires less votes. So now it goes through. But I want to like point out this specific quote from one of the senators that was involved in this in 1898. The Constitution is territorial in its operation. It cannot have any binding force or operation beyond the territorial limits of the government in which they are promulgated. In other words, the Constitution um, cannot reach across the territorial boundaries of the United States into the territorial domain of another government and affect that government or persons or property therein. He, like said again, reiterated two years later that he utterly repudiates the power of Congress to annex the Hawaiian Islands by a joint resolution such as passed in the Senate. It is ipso facto null and void. So you have this annexation happening. You have people that are in the government speaking out and saying, hey, you can't just write a resolution saying that this is a part of the United States now, the same way that Hawaii can't by their legislature write one and say, hey, okay, now we own the United States. And then the Republicans who just recognize that Hawaii is a very strategic location are like, well, yes, we, we just can write this resolution and annex it. Yep, we're gonna. That's just what we're gonna do. (laughs) Yeah. So like now this happens um, and eventually so this is all this is all happening what in like 1898, right? So now it's officially Hawaii is officially like a US territory. And now we have things that are starting to come into play where like Hawaii eventually becomes a state and how it becomes a state. And then also like what the United Nations has to say about how this whole procedure went down. And we're going to talk more about that. So just everybody take a moment to imagine, right? There was actually a news story about this recently where this woman came home and there were two men that had broken into her house and they were like sitting on her couch and she called the police and they're like, wait, do you all live here or does she live here? And she's like, yo, this is my house. And they asked the men like, what's the number on the door? And they were like, oh, you know, I don't know. Anyways, I don't remember exactly how that situation got resolved, but just, you know, imagine this for a second. Like, You come home, you know, some strangers have, uh, you know, broken into your home and they're living there and you're sort of waiting for the police to come do something about this. The police don't come do anything about it. And then all of a sudden these two people are like, yeah, so we signed a treaty saying that we're going to make your house a part of this thing over here. And it's like, wait, how are you making decisions about my house? And that's like kind of kind of where we're at. So, you know, it's not the best analogy in the world, but just walk. I like it. I think it totally makes sense. (laughs) That's exactly it. It does. It feels like with the question of whether the annexation of Hawaii was legal at all. It's like the United States is deliberating and determining whether or not this was a a legal coup and then a, a valid annexation. And it's like. Well, why are you over there the ones deciding whether or not this was right? You're the ones who did this. Yeah, seriously. So we've like talked about some of the the way that this all played out. Um, I also want to point out that even like in, from the Department of the Interior, they say that the United States annexed Hawaii, quote, without the consent of or compensation to the indigenous people of Hawaii or their sovereign government, who were thereby denied the mechanism for expression of their inherent sovereignty through self-government and self-determination. So this is a quote from the Department of the Interior, the U.S. Department of the Interior from 2016, right? So there's instances where we can see people even now still questioning this um, from United Nations standpoint, because again, when it comes to things like international law, Unfortunately, it's not as easy as, you know, when you come home to your house and there's two men in there that broke in and you call the police. Like, who do you call about international law? Right. And so, of course, one of the authorities that are kind of, you know, referenced or spoken to in situations like this, we have United Nations and we also have things like the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which is sort of like recognized by United Nations, right? Yeah, when the the tricky thing with that permanent court of arbitrations is they don't really, I mean, and the United Nations, they don't really have real power in terms of actually dealing with consequences if the people don't want to uh, obey obey their their jurisdiction. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Uh, From the permanent court of arbitration, 
Uh, they allege that, quote, the government of the Hawaiian kingdom is in continual violation of, A, its 1849 Treaty of Friendship, Commerce, and Navigation with the United States of America, as well as the principles of international law laid down in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treatises, 1969, and, B, quote, continuing, the principles of international comedy for allowing the unlawful imposition of American municipal laws over the claimant's person within the territorial jurisdiction of the Hawaiian kingdom. Yeah, and this Ooh. is from Larson versus the <laughs> This is from Larson versus the Hawaiian kingdom. This is a case in the Permanent Court of Arbitration from 1999. And the reason why we're bringing this up is to point out that yeah, we've been talking about some stuff that happened in theory like 100 years ago, but this is still like somewhat of an ongoing thing today and there are still native Hawaiians even today that are protesting or fighting for their sovereignty and still saying like, "Hey guys, seriously, I'm snapping. I don't know if you all can hear it, but hey, guys, like this thing that happened, this was like a wrong that happened and we're still dealing with this. You know, it has never really been addressed. And so um, this case in particular, we're talking about in the Permanent Court of Arbitration, which, like I said, is recognized by United Nations. Lance Paul Larson, a resident of Hawaii, sought redress from the Hawaiian kingdom for its failure to protect him from the United States and the state of Hawaii, because the whole idea is, you know, is they a thing, is, uh, you know, from their from their standpoint, is the state of Hawaii a thing? Right. And so that's sort of like what's going on today is that you have native Hawaiians that are still fighting for their sovereignty, still saying like, hey, this is not the state of Hawaii. This is an illegal occupation that has been going on for the past 100 years. And also, while we're talking about the United Nations, even um, Dr. Alfred DeZayas, who was the United Nations independent expert for the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in 2018. So this is recent. This is 2018. This is like two. This is in February 2018. So literally three years ago, almost to the day. And he's like, you know, as a professor of international law and the former secretary of the UN, UN Human Rights Committee, uh, we sort of need to examine this. And he says that it's a nation state that is under a strange form of occupation by the United States, resulting from an illegal military occupation and a fraudulent annexation. As such, international laws, parentheses, the Hague and Geneva Conventions require that the governance and legal matters within the occupied territory of the Hawaiian Islands must be administered by the application of the laws of the occupied state, in this case, the Hawaiian Kingdom, not the domestic laws of the occupier, the United States. So the the point of this is that there's still a question here, a question that has not really been officially answered. It's a really tricky situation. I think it goes back to, uh, I mean, Grover Cleveland's presidency when the Republicans in Congress were like, well, we issued our own commission and it concluded that we we're fine. So case closed. <laughs> we're done. Like, I think at least in the United States mind, they wanted this to be a closed case and case closed uh, for ever since it, it happened in, in 53. Actually, on the 100-year anniversary of the overthrow of Hawaii, of the Hawaiian kingdom in 1993, uh, President Bill Clinton actually issued an apology resolution, which, again, I mean, it, it's good to, to recognize, but it's still sort of like, a, okay, case closed, we're done now, it's done, we're good, thumbs up, bye. <laughs> At least that's a little bit how it how it read to me. Like, no one wants... No one in in uh, American politics wants to really reckon with the the sins of their past in a meaningful way, other than be like we we see it and we're done and and that's it. And at least they're like acknowledging that it happened, which is why the apology resolution was like sort of a a start. But the thing is, is like the thing about acknowledging that it happened is like okay, now we're looking at the sort of real world or like present day manifestations or ramifications of how that played out. And that's where you bring in things like the Hawaiian sovereignty movement, which, you know, present day, like, for example, you have different groups of Native Hawaiians, of Indigenous Hawaiians that are fighting for tribal sovereignty, like federal recognition, because, for example, like Indigenous Americans in the continental U.S. have that and Indigenous Hawaiians do not have that at this point. And so that is where you set up basically sort of like a government to government recognition where they recognize them as sort of like an independent nation, the way that you have with many of the tribes of indigenous people like on the continental U.S. And like they currently don't have that. So there are some 
people in the Hawaiian sovereignty movement that want to have tribal sovereignty, whereas there are other people that are like the United States shouldn't even have the jurisdiction to bestow that on us because we should have complete independence. Like this is an illegal occupation. And I think it's worth noting that similar to indigenous peoples like on the mainland, that there are a lot of instances where like all of these things are still impacting these people to this day, you know, like Native Hawaiians have, you know, higher rates of health issues, like higher rates of homelessness. Like if you look at the median income of people of, you know, different races and demographics that live in Hawaii, you see that Native Hawaiians have a med- like a lower median income. And there are statistics about this. Like there's empirical data that shows the way that these people are like still being impacted. Yeah, I think that's incredibly important, bringing that into the 21st century and realizing that these, I say stories from history in a way that I hope doesn't sound derivative, but but stories from history that can seem like they're, you know, closed case textbooks still has, still have modern ramifications and political issues to this day. So I want to know, do you live in Hawaii or have ties to, to Hawaii? Are you a native Hawaiian or do you have Further knowledge or firsthand experience with tribal sovereignty for indigenous people in the continental U.S.? Or are you involved in the fight for a a sovereign Hawaiian Asian? I would love to know. Please reach out. Yeah, yeah. Are you an expert in international law or have experience in international (laughs) law? Like, no, seriously, I would love to hear. Do you work for the U.N.? (laughs) I would love to hear people's input on this. So, yeah, there are numerous ways that you can reach out to us. But first, before we talk about the ways that you can reach out to STDWITK, Dana, do you want to tell people where they can find your other work or anything like that? Yes, absolutely. Please follow me on Twitter uh, or Instagram and Instagram at Dana Schwartz with three Z's. I, I desperately need your validation. And please, uh, if you're if you're interested in listening to me talk about historical royals, subscribe and listen to my podcast, Noble Blood. Yeah, awesome. And seriously, I can't say enough. Thank you so much for joining us today. So yeah, like give her a follow. You can also follow STDWITK on various social media platforms. Of course, maybe you don't like social media because you think that the you know that these sites are spying on you which is completely true in which case you can reach out to us at 1833stdwytk and of course as always if you don't like phones if you don't like social media if you prefer to do it a little bit more the old-fashioned way then you can always shoot us an email we are conspiracy at iheartradio.com Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.